Good afternoon. This is the first and the last time that I may say that this is my first conference presentation. I'm a new PhD student at the University of Cape Town. I will not be presenting on my fledgling research, but rather on the work that I did with my team at the African Collaboration for Quantitative Finance and Risk Research Mathematical Finance Team Challenge. So I'm briefly just going to say a word about the Team Challenge. It was held in June this year and is now becoming an annual thing for us where we have four teams, each led by a PhD student, accompanied by two to three master students, and each team is given 10 days to solve a problem that is assigned to them either by an academic or by an industry practitioner. I'll briefly indicate our industry practitioner there, that's Jason Dunn. He is a commodities trader from Standard Chartered, and he posed the problem to my team. Our solution to his problem is what I'll be presenting to you now. Um, the talk is going to proceed in three parts. I'm going to discuss the problem, as well as how we went about the modeling solution, I will talk about the resulting simulation, and finally I'll talk about what was truly important to Jason, which is how can we use these results, how can we use these results to hedge. Let's jump right in. Our problem as posed to us by Jason Dunn was, he wants to sell and buy options on the spread between two points on a commodities futures curve. So our first question is, why is this difficult? Well, the first question is, why do you want to do it? And the second question is, why is it difficult? You want to do it because people would like to trade in the commodities futures market in the same way that they trade in the forex futures market. Which means that if your spot position moves against you, you want to be able to take an offsetting position in the near dated future. Because in the forex, in the foreign exchange futures market, you expect an almost parallel shift in that curve. This happens to not be the case in the commodities futures market. What can happen in the commodities futures market is the sign of the commodities futures curve can change. So the basis can be either positive or negative, where we define the basis as the difference between the spot and the future. So the question is, how can we hedge this sign change? So I can buy this hedge and then execute the same sort of positions that I would execute in the Forex market. And um, Jason's solution to this problem was, sell me this option, the spread option, which is a call on the difference between two points on the futures curve. And I just briefly outline what our time horizon looks like there. The long dated future will mature at cap T2, the short dated cap T1, and the option will mature at cap T. To be able to answer this question, we need to ask what are the peculiarities of the futures market, what are the peculiarities of the commodities market that we need to capture in our model for this thing to make sense. We're going to talk about these four stylized facts of commodities market. The first one is the one that's really causing the problem for us, backwardation and contango. What that means is that the futures curve basis can change sign. On the right there, I illustrated. At the top, you can see this is for LME copper futures. You can see the, the futures curve is in contango. And then um, six months later, the futures curve is in backwardation. That six months is not very long for the life of an, op of, of an option. So you can imagine that this can cause problems. You also have the stylized fact of mean reversion in both the spot and in the convenience yield. I'm going to pause you briefly and just talk to you what I mean by convenience yield. Convenience yield is what typically described as a flow of services or the value of holding the spot versus holding the future. You can imagine, you can easily imagine a situation where the spot commodity becomes more valuable than the near dated future, especially if inventories are low. Then you can immediately capitalize on shocks to the spot. <coughs> the Samuelson effect, Paul Samuelson, famous economist, that states that if we push out the maturity of a futures contract in the commodities market, we expect the volatility of that contract to decline. You can imagine this as saying, information that moves the spot shouldn't move the long-dated future. If an oil tanker goes down in the harbor today, we expect the near-dated futures to feel that effect in their price. We do, no one expects that to affect the five-year future. And lastly, seasonality. Seasonality is an incredibly important effect in commodities markets. We're not going to consider that here, as we were mostly concerned with copper, aluminum, aluminium, and nickel. So we're going to try and capture those first three stylized facts in our model and then use our model to price and hedge a commodity spread option. If you're moving into a region for the first time and you know nothing about it, what you do is read review papers. Those are the two primary review papers that we looked at for term structure modeling of commodities futures prices. I'm going to do this review very briefly. When you're given a problem like this, the first thing you want to do is look for analytical solutions or at least approximations. Um, this is not the first paper in which Carol Alexander states this, but it's a well-established fact that if you have a basket option with a non-zero strike, you don't have an analytical solution. And in a, in a sense, that's what we have. This um, Kaldana and Fuzai paper from last year provides tight analytical bounds for spread options when you can come up with a joint characteristic function. At the time, we didn't think it was feasible that you could write down a joint analytical 
characteristic function for a model that captures enough of these stylized facts. But I'll speak on this, so we didn't pursue this route, but I'll speak on this a little bit more at the end of this time. The models for commodity markets and the term structure models follow a very typical evolution. We are specifically uh, sticking to the Schwartz end of the stream. He did a lot of the work in commodity modeling. But you can see how the thought process would develop. You'd obviously start with geometric Brownian motion, which is something we know very well, but that captures none of the features. You'd move on to just a simple one-factor mean reversion, so that at least you're capturing mean reversion in your spot. Two-factor models generally are developed along two lines, where the additional factor is either the convenience yield or the long-run mean. And then three-factor models, the obvious third factor to add is stochastic rates. Latia shows in 2005 in this paper that over the short and medium term, this three-factor model proposed by Swartz is empirically very similar to the two-factor model. At that point, we were confident in our understanding to proceed with the Swartz two-factor model, simply because we have a better intuitive understanding of what the convenience yield is and how we expect it to behave as compared to the long-run mean. Let's look at the Schwartz two-factor. This is the model we selected, and we'll show some analysis regarding why. One of the most famous term structure models, models of commodity prices. When you have 10 days to come up with a solution, you kind of want to choose a mainstream solution, because then there's literature surrounding it. The real-world dynamics are straightforward to describe. We have some ornstein nullenbeck process for the convenience yield, and we have essentially, uh, we have that con convenience yield feeding into the drift of the spot price. By inspection, do we gain anything just looking at this model at first glance in terms of what we capture of the market characteristics? So you can see here that if we have a positive correlation between the two Brownian motions that are driving the two processes, because the convenience yield is feeding to the drift in a negative way, we can induce mean reversion in the spot by that positive correlation. So we've captured one of our stylized facts without doing any analysis. We can simply look at the model. This was very encouraging to us. But if you want to gain any more, you have to start doing some analysis. We changed to the risk neutral framework, which we're going to use because we're pricing and hedging derivative contracts. This was standard for us. We have two things. We have two market prices of risks. We have this traditional equation where future prices are Q martingales. We can come up with an analytical expression for the futures price, very similar to what you would get in an affine model for the short rate, with this A of tau, where tau is just the distance, and B of tau are complicated but deterministic functions of the model parameters. This allows us to do an empirical investigation of how much futures curve dynamics can we capture. This is a completely just from our parameters to investigate and say, right, it appears that through the dynamics of the futures curve, we can at least capture both backwardation and contango. We're not restricted to only one interpretation of that curve. So that's one more stylized fact that the Swartz two-factor model will capture for us. We've got one more to go. And that one is the Samuelson effect. To speak about that, we need the volatility of the futures contracts to decrease when we push out their maturity. It's well established, it was shown by Lertia, it was shown again by, it was shown originally by Schwartz in his 1997 paper, <coughs> that you do have this limit for your variance of your futures price if you push up the maturity. But um, as far as we are aware, no one in the literature shows what is necessary for that limit to converge from above so that you know you have a decreasing volatility as you push out the maturity. One of my teammates did this. The result is very easy to interpret. What essentially happens is you have an upper bound constraint on your convenience yield volatility on your standard deviation relative to your spot volatility. And you can see that from the previous graph. If you have a too high convenience yield volatility, it has almost a whiplash effect throughout your curve, and you induce high volatilities in the far dated future. So you have to be careful for that. Now we've captured three stylized facts. Three is what we were going for. Um, I'm going to briefly say something about once we were here, we were happy to move on to Monte Carlo simulation. This model is tractable for Monte Carlo simply because we have joint transition densities that are Gaussian in the log of the spot and in the convenience yield. Monte Carlo simulation, all of us are familiar with it, it's straightforward to do. One of the things I want to mention here that you have to be careful of is how you go do your hedge. If you want to construct your hedge, you have to be careful of your first year undergraduate calculus and the chain rule. We're hedging futures contracts, but what we're simulating is the spot and the convenience yield. What that means, especially for us, if you can come up with another way of approximating the delta, what we looked at is central difference deltas. We were doing Monte Carlo already, therefore doing a Monte Carlo method for the delta seemed intuitive. But um, you can only determine finite difference deltas with respect to the variables that you're simulating. Does that make sense? If I want a finite difference delta, I can only shift the spot or I can shift the convenience yield. I can't shift the future. The only way to shift the future is through that mechanism. What that means is I needed to simultaneously solve 
two partial differential equations, two partial derivative equations, to show that how these things relate to each other. I know that no one in the audience would make the mistake of not using the chain rule, but what I want to just state quickly is that if you use this for a call, which is our first test was using them on, on European calls and seeing if we can price and hedge. If you just take the delta with respect to the spot, your adjustment is a time varying factor that's one at time zero. So you won't see this bias and realize you've made a mistake until you try to hedge later in time. That's why I just wanted to highlight this. Right, now we're in a good place that we can do simulated profit and loss. Right? This is checking essentially the internal consistency of our model. What we do is we assume some parameter set that we know. We say it came from the market, but we construct some parameter set. We price a spread option in our model using Monte Carlo simulation. We sell that spread option. We buy the deltas, borrowing from the cash account. That P&L at, at, at time zero should be zero. Then we evolve. So we've generated an evolution of the spot curve in the background, and you evolve according to that curve, hedging at each time step. This tells us very little, except, look, all the P&Ls are around zero, yay. But to be able to draw conclusions from that, you need to do a distribution. You need to do this over many time steps, and that's what we're going to look at next. So this is a simulated profit and loss distribution for the spread option under this model. Our mean is sitting slightly to the left of zero. An interpretation of this graph, so I've given it in terms of percentages of your initial option premium. So an intuitive interpretation of this graph is saying a one standard deviation event for you hedging this option could be losing up to 20% of your premium. Right? In a worst case, one standard deviation event if you push further out. The graph does have long tails. It is slightly to the left of zero. Our interpre interpretation of that attributes it to two factors. The first is obviously we're doing a discrete daily delta hedge for a continuous time model. And the other is we're not really trading the spot in the underlying, sorry, the spot in the convenience yield. We're not trading the sources of risk. We're trading them through a proxy, which is the future. Now, once we've looked at this profit and loss distribution, we're fairly certain that the model is internally consistent. Now we want to go to the market. To be able to do that, you need parameters. And um, derivative pricing, as we all know, needs forward-looking parameters. And the forward-looking volatilities can theoretically be obtained from the quoted call volatilities that you see in the market. I use the word theoretically here because it's possible, but there's really no best practice, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit. What I first want to say, though, is it's not sensible to expect market-traded instruments which will allow you calibration of the historical parameters. You don't expect a market-traded instrument today to tell you what the long-run mean of the convenience yield should be. So to recover those, we use a common filter. In the interest of time, I'm going to go very quickly over how the common filter works. Um, anyone who has any experience with it knows that it has its own set of difficulties when you try and do parameter estimation. And I also want to make the distinction between parameter estimation and parameter calibration. This is estimation. We're t taking this model, running it against historical data and saying, what are the best parameters? Calibration is when I try and get back market prices, which we'll do in the last step. And finally, what our team did is we were lucky enough to discover a bespoke R implementation of the Schwartz 97 two-factor model, specifically for calibrate for estimating these parameters through a common filter. This was done by um, a couple of very nice gentlemen at, at a Swiss university, Philip Erb and his compatriots, and they were very happy that we were going to include their link in our presentation. This is just an example of the parameter estimation results. We're running on copper data, LME copper data from January 2002 to December 2013. Um, we can say that they're in line with those found in Schwartz 1997. So he also looked at copper data over a slightly different period. Um, we can also say, which is encouraging, that they satisfy the necessary inequality for the Samuelson effect to hold. Just note that that mean parameter is not expected return because we have the convenience yield feeding into the spot. So we're not saying that there's 100% expected return on the spot. So. What we're about to show you is simul <coughs> simulations using out-of-sample market data. So we calibrate up to a certain point in time. Those are now our fixed historical calibrations. We look in the market for the call prices and we try and calibrate our volatilities. Then we evolve according to the market data, having sold the option and try and hedge it. And we see how well we can do. So for the European call case, just doing that, we seem to do okay. I consider two call options here. I don't want to be here too long. We expected, here to, we expected this to go well. If you do what I've just described, to try and do a historical profit and loss for the spread option, you lose 25% of your premium, which is a greater than one standard deviation event for us, and clearly implies that something's gone wrong. So when we hit this point, we were quite dismayed. 
But there is an intuitive thing that you can do as a next step, which makes sense to us and yields better results. What you can say is you can say, we don't expect market activity today to tell us as much about the convenience yield volatility as it does about the spot volatility. So when I do my calibration to call prices, which I can do in a least square sense, I'm going to say, let's constrain my convenience yield volatility to take into account at least some percentage of the historical vol of that convenience yield. When you do that, again, this is one path, we end up with a 3.2% profit on our profit and loss for this hedge against real world data. And this is well within one standard deviation of what we expect. We've also done this for nickel, which I'm not going to show. So, in conclusion, over the course of 10 days, we believe that the model is sufficient to capture the basic market behavior, the stylized facts, and to allow us to price and hedge a spread option against real world data subject to the correct calibration of the forward-looking volatilities. We were incredibly happy with this. Further research, I think it's obvious that, I'm going to just touch on point three first, if you look at how that spread is evolving, just intuitively, at first glance, it looks like it's jumping. And I want to say, can we add that into the model that people have investigated that? The other two things is how sensitive are we to the misspecification of parameters? And of course, how robust is the common filter estimation? How often do we need to repeat that procedure to ensure that we stay within those acceptable bounds. My final remark is to please send all your students to the Aquifer MFTC. It was an absolute blast for us. We had a great time. Thank you for your attention.